Um, we're HP networking here. Um, so originally what we wanted to do was to come in and give you a whole bunch of slides, but um, Tom talked us out of that. So for those Yay, of you Tom. who have followed us previously, um, so I've, this is the third, fourth, one of these, something like that. Um, my name is Chris Young. I'm the uh, representing officially the marketing people today. Um, technical marketing engineer, capital T, little m. And basically what we've done for the last few of these is we've come and talked about SDN and the wonders of SDN and how great SDN is on a slide deck and PowerPoint and what we're going to be able to do eventually with SDN. And when we, we decided we were going to come and do a tech field day again, I said there's absolutely no way I'm talking about SDN. I have absolutely no desire to come and talk to you guys about something that's not real. And then I got thrown a curveball and we actually made it real. So here with me today, I got Jeff Enters, um, and Jeff is our chief. Chief networking architect and strategist. Yeah. So um, <laughs> could you make that title longer? <laughs> yeah. Right. Shortening that down, Jeff makes stuff work. That's kind of his job, is um, from a professional services standpoint. So what Jeff has actually done is um, put together a uh, national SDN network controller sitting across the country full um, open flow in a hybrid mode um, from an HP standpoint, meaning what we can do is run select surgical precision rule sets and then just normal pipeline out to normal pipeline so we can allow traditional network protocols to work and do what they do. And considering we're actually doing it live and he's had the opportunity to be able to run this network for a while now in a real environment, um, I figured I would let you guys throw stones at him and kind of nail him for you know, what is it like to actually operate a, an open flow based network um, cross country? What were the challenges? What are, we, what are we actually seeing? What's working? What's not? How did latency, how did distance affect all those kind of questions, right? So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and um, basically allow him to whiteboard out what we've done. And if there's any follow ups, it's actually running downstairs in the knock. So this is not a smoke and mirrors um, whiteboard look what we did. and. You can actually go downstairs and see it if you uh, wanted to afterwards. So this network is within HP? Oh, he will cover all that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yep. All right, so thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So as Chris mentioned, I'm Jeff Enters. Um, we'll just call me an architect, uh, network architect uh, for our TS uh, consulting organization. So I'm part of our world, <coughs> excuse me, our worldwide portfolio team. So I help to develop our services that our consultants are out there delivering. I'm actually a consultant background myself. I was a consultant for 20 plus years. Uh, so I still get out there with those consultants as we're developing these services and help to, to deliver them and build them and, and get out there and uh, uh, again, build the services, understand what customers need from a consulting standpoint and get out there and get it done. So that's just a little background on me out of Chicago, Canadian stuff. Um, and uh, so we, uh, I don't, is anyone familiar with InteropNet? InteropNet, the network behind the show, anyone? Yep. Okay, so we got one or two. So InteropNet is the network that typically runs the interop shows. So it's the actual, the, the cable drops going into each booth, uh, the Wi-Fi throughout, the, uh, the keynote speaks, the, all that kind of stuff, management, all that entire network is, is, is staged out in a warehouse in California, brought into the show, set up, built, services the entire show, and then it's torn down and, and put back. Um, so we've, we've been doing that for a number of years. For this show, they didn't decided not to do that network, and instead do just uh, what used to be called iLabs, and so for this one's being called SDN Lab, uh, so I decided to do that just for the show. <clears throat> but as part of that uh, InteropNet network, I've been doing the InteropNet network for, uh, since 2009. So I've been doing it for a while. Um, and so as part of that, we've built, uh, from an HP standpoint, we have a number of products in three data centers across the, the country that, uh, that, that support that actual show network as we build those up and tear them down. So with that, I'll start to uh, diagram this out just a little bit for you here so you start to get some idea of what we got. So we got our... Our, well, it's actually in Sunnyvale, California, what we call SFO is, is what we call that data center. And then we've got Denver, and then we have EWR or Newark, New Jersey. And I have to be careful telling people about EWR. I had a guy that I work with that actually booked his flight to EWR because I was using airport codes and I was telling him about this. So he actually flew into Newark and didn't realize that he was boarding a plane. He was boarding the plane. He's like, Book my flight to Newark instead of New York, 
LaGuardia, anything else? Yes. Well, luckily, it wasn't too far he made it, but be careful using the, the airport codes is what I've learned this show. Uh, Mayor LaGuardia once landed at Newark and demanded to be taken to New York. <laughs> See? There you go. So anyway, so we've got these three data centers, right, that have been supporting these shows. And so as a, a Las Vegas or a New York show would show up, right, there was feeds going down to each one of these. So for, for, the, New York, for the Las Vegas show, we had gig pipes going out of SFO in Denver, and for New York, coming out of Denver in EWR. <clears throat> so that's the way it's historically worked. So we have these pipes that are coming down into New York already. And uh, it's okay, we go deploy these networks in the show, remove them, put them back in. So what we do, uh, so what we've got is we've got these pipes that are already coming in here. So I said, we've got these pipes, we've got this SDN demo going on, let's see what we can do to really build this thing out, actually show the apps that we've got. I wanted to show multiple applications running on one SDN controller. I thought that was a key one that I wanted to try and demonstrate in a real world environment. Distance, latency, hops, everything else included. And then, uh, and then also, um, yeah, the multiple apps, multiple controllers controlling the same switch, uh, the distance again in between there, all those kind of things to see how this really put, go, starts playing together. Are and controlling the WAN device or the actual WAN switches within the site? Yep, so perfect, perfect question leading into the next part of this. So this, these three data centers not only feed those two shows that I just had up there, but they also feed a number of other shows. So you've got, well, I won't go into all the other shows right now, but there's a number of other shows that they take these pipes, that they have pipes going out of these data centers into these other shows. And so this, this network is not just used for Las Vegas and New York Interop. Clearly, they don't build up that kind of an environment just for that. It's actually used for a number of other shows that it consists throughout the year. So our challenge in all of this, to bring it to more of a real-world environment, is how can we deploy SDN and not break anything, right? So we've got to make sure that we don't impact any of the other shows in this. So uh, to give you a little bit more of a layout here, so in each one of these colos, we've got a router, and we've got gig pipes that go between each one of the data centers, okay? Gig pipes, essentially dark fiber, um, so unplug one side, other side goes down, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then the other thing that we have down here is what we call our warehouse. Our warehouse or a hot stage facility, HTSF is what we actually call it. Oops, HSTF, hot stage test facility is what we call it. And so what we've got there is we've got three DS3s. So this is, what we, this is how it works, right? Before we go into a show, we obviously can't take over a convention center, stage the network, wait for the show to come and just turn it all up, right? We've got to stage it someplace, and that's where we stage it out here is in this, in this hot stage test facility, which is literally a warehouse in Brisbane, California that we have with lots of DS3s, lots of, lots of power that comes into that facility. And so we stage these, and we normally have somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 uh, seven-foot racks of, of equipment. Not full racks, every rack, but as we come into these shows, some are half height, some are full height uh, racks to distribute around the show and get everything uh, deployed out, right? So we stage all that out there. So as we were looking at this from an SDN standpoint, how, again, as this is serving up the entire, uh, all these other shows, how can we keep this live? How can we go into this hot stage facility, be able to set this up, see if it's actually gonna work, and then what happens when we move it out here to the New York show, right? So if I put this one out here, because I think this might just work best. So this is uh, New York, right, Javits. Okay, then we got these multiple gig pipes coming into here. Um, so it looks like a six, but you get it. Um, so these multiple gig pipes coming into the Javits. So how do we how do we set all this up? Um, as we started looking at it, and and again trying to keep things real, real world environments. How are we going to do this? So in each one of these uh, colos, we have that was horrible. Let's redo that. Um, we have a DMZ and an out of band management switch in each one of these colos. Okay. And then out of, going north out of each one of these colos, we actually have uh, three one gig pipes going to public. Okay. Um, so what's nice is these out-of-band management switches literally plug directly into a one gig connection 
going straight out to public. So that's our way to, that's our out of band management. This is one gig pipes going into each one of these data centers. So we've got, we've got some resources to play with, right? Um, so again, how do we do this without impact and everything? So what we looked at and says, well, it would make sense for us with our applications. I think everybody's fairly familiar with our apps in this room, our different applications, or should I dive a little bit on those? Okay, fair enough. So, um, so our applications, I think the good part about our current applications is that they're really, in my opinion, they're designed for that kind of step one into SDN. They're designed for that access layer of the network. They're not, they don't require a complete redesign of my existing environment. I can put them in in very strategic and targeted locations, um, things of that nature. So, uh, so as we looked at this, we said, well, it makes sense that we can turn on OpenFlow on these different switches that we have out there, right? So it started to do like our network protector application, which I'll talk about a little bit more, but you certainly want to do some more protection things in a DMZ environment, or even in our out-of-band management environment. We don't have anything protecting that right now. So how do we start to protect that? And I mean, brute force attacks, we are just constantly brute forced on everything we have up there. We have zero protection. They just, it's just uh, nonstop brute force on those. So how can we start to uh, protect those? So that was one area that we targeted. We wanted to make sure that this, uh, th these routers, that we didn't touch those. So those are all, this is one BGP, for those that know BGP, BGP AS, so it's our 53692, is this AS, so it's a private AS. And then what we have is an AS that we move around, AS290. So obviously for those of you, again, that know BGP AS290 means uh, Interop Net got that a long time ago. So we have 290 that we take and we move around to the different shows. And then we've got 209 is, is CenturyLink that we, uh, that we peer up with going northbound. So, so how do we do this, right? We don't want to impact any environment, keep the shows running. So targeted attacks on the show. So the next part was, well, where are we going to put the controller? So we need to test here. We need to move out here. So the original idea was, well, let's put it on a device right here with us that goes on a truck. It's driven out to, to New York, put out there, and we just keep it local, which didn't sound fun to me. <laughs> didn't, didn't seem to introduce any challenges, didn't it, it introduce any risks. So, so we went ahead and we put it hanging off the DMZ controller. Oops, controller, good enough. So our controller actually sits up there in, in San Francisco and then is pointed at DMZ and OOB switches in each one of these locations. Making sense so far? Okay, so open flow from this controller, controlling those. So then at this hot stage facility, I'll draw what we had out there because all we did is, is move it, right? Is all we did was took this gig pipe and do a 3800 down into another 3800. Okay, then we did the same thing here. This down, 3800, second 3800. Whoops. So that was as simple as we wanted to go. We didn't want to put too much equipment down there. We wanted to have a uh, spread out network. One other thing we actually did. So these links that go up into the colos actually terminate up in the routers. But we also introduced another 3800 here and a 3800 here. These are really more for, for future use as we get more applications and things like that. Um, so it was maybe to chime in here just to balance to a 3800 is an HP 3800 switch yeah. roughly equivalent to a 3750 stackable kind of 24 port 48 port this is not rocket yeah. science stuff yeah it's a switch yeah. right basic layer two switch can do some routing functionality yep through. yep it will yeah do some routing functionality but basic yeah so thank you Chris um, so we in introduced that for, for more later, uh, later times, and I'll talk about that a little more. But so it was, now it's, okay, so what are we going to do about downtime? How are we going to turn this on in this environment? And, and what we found is it's, it's fairly simple, right? Um, so a couple of these switches um, did not need code upgrades. The ones that did, it was a code upgrade. Maintenance, maintenance time, simple reboot, and then, and then turn on open flow on just the VLANs that we wanted to turn it on. So we had some VLANs that we said, like especially on the DMZ switches, we had some VLANs that were, were hosting some specific services that we just, we absolutely could not take. We had to have a zero risk environment. So we just didn't turn it on in those areas. And then we turned it on in other areas where it's protecting our C7000 we have sitting out here, which is one of our big blade chassis with a bunch of virtualized equipment in it or virtualized services in it. We turned it on on that one to protect that entire environment. So we're gonna turn it on all those. Turn on these switches out in this environment. So our next challenge became, how are we going to replicate 
a Javits Center environment because we just don't have the distance. So we did the best we could and just ended up routing things like up through Denver, over to San Francisco and down. That's all we had to do. But it's not a similar environment at all because this is a fully routed DS3. These are flat layer two physical pipes that we have here. So we had to take some risk in doing that. We went ahead and did it, simulated it, and just had to work with what, what happened coming out here. Um, which we, we, everything actually went fine with that. We actually did good with that part of the move from a, uh, from a layer two, layer three standpoint, right? Uh, essentially everything was layer three here. So we tried to do as much as we could to make it similar out here, not 100%, but again, things worked. Yep? The switches down at the Javits, are those support, is that supporting just HP's network here, like for your booth, or are those switches are the, the focal points and the, and the WAN work points for every, all traffic doming? Leaving this conference, coming back up. Yeah, so what we have hanging off of here, uh, off of this network right now, is, is essentially three things. We've got the HP booth, we've got the Blue Cap booth, and then we also have the entire SDN lab booth. So that's been our other challenge in this, right, is we're actually putting full production traffic here at this show across this network and running our live demos across it at the same time. And I think if I can remember the, the logos, SDN lab has what, Big Switch, Maru. Well, so Tell me, Tell me. So, from your standpoint, you're viewing it as three tenths. If you are viewing it as ten. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You could sure. Yeah. You could absolutely look at it that way. So, um, yeah. And and we wanted to be able to. So and we're doing full open flow on on those uh, on those both of those booths, right? From an HP and and for, well, actually all three, even the SDN one. Um, but it's it's in a hybrid mode, right? So that it's going to run through an open flow table, see if it if it makes a match. If it does, it'll pick it. If not. It's just going to send it on its normal merry way of layer three or layer two, layer three switch route, right? And right now, layer ten flow do you have configured? Yeah, so so we've got uh, we've got three apps running right now. We've got our, our HP uh, network protector, and our uh, HP network optimizer, and then our uh, the Blue Cat DNS director. So we've got those three apps currently running on here. Uh, which, so maybe just we'll do the Reader's Digest version. So Network Protector, what it does is it basically hijacks DNS requests at the edge and then pushes them off, compares them to the tipping point digital vaccine, and looks for no non-botnets, um, you know, non-good yeah. stuff. So that changed names. It used to be something else. Was, yeah, we, we were... Sentinel. Uh, yeah, you, Sentinel, you, right? you knew it as Sentinel, yeah. Right. yeah. Marketing got involved, name changed. Right. Yeah. Um, it happens. <laughs> um, network Protector would have been the link demo that I think... No, Optimizer. Uh, or Optimizer, yeah. Uh, optimizer. optimizer. So um, Network Optimizer actually uses the Microsoft Link 2.0 API and actually has Link communicate directly with the controller, talk about the endpoints, and allows the network at the edge to uh, mark the QoS on the, the actual calls as they hit the network because the call controller has the knowledge of the two points. So we're actually marking QoS on the edge of the network. Right? So for the DNS, we're using, you said, Bluecat or working point or both? Uh, both in different <coughs> ways in different parts of the network, actually. Yep. Yeah, so that was one of our challenges, right? Thanks for that, Chris. So is uh, so we said, you know, what happens when you start getting these multiple apps and what's going to happen? Well, the, the DNS director from Blue Cat and our network protector conflict because they both want to peel off that, that UDP port 53, right? Any pack that's heading towards that, it wants to send up to the controller. So what we did for that is we've actually put, we put a second controller in here, and one controller is running network optimizer and network protector, right? And the other one's running this DNS director. So we had to run a separate controller. It was a VM. Plenty of room, plenty of space, spin it up. It wasn't a big deal for us. But now it's a matter of what do you do down at the show. So what we did is we just split this 3800. So we have a, a client that's doing the, the DNS director from Blue Cat hanging off of one side. So that VLAN is pointed to that controller. And then the other VLAN for network protector and optimizer is pointed at the other controller. Uh, functionality wise, are they accomplishing the same thing? No, they're not. So the, the uh, network protector is doing uh, the DNS pickoff and then it does a rep DB lookup for mail. Right? So any you know, any rogue sites, things like that. And so if it identifies any, it does a redirect, and you can redirect to obviously wherever you want. We just have it go into a blue splash splash page that says, you know, you've been protected by a protector. And then um, on the uh, Blue Cat DNS director, that's looking for uh, attempts to hit rogue DNS servers. So if you try to hit 8.8.8, .8 right, 4.2.2.2, right, things like that, it's going to, it's going to peel you off. And what that one actually does is kind of, it's kind of cool, is it sends it up 
to, uh, to Proteus, right? For those of you that know BlueCast, the DNS server, essentially, and sends it up to Proteus. Proteus determines whether or not it's a, it's a legit site they're trying to go to. If it's a legit site, it sends the packet back down to the switch, or to the, it, sends the, it actually sends the DNS response right to the client, and the client thinks the response came from 8.8.8 .8 or whatever DNS server they were trying to use. The it looks like the response actually came back, came back from that DNS server, but it didn't. It came back from the corporate DNS server. So it's a, it's a nice one. So like in our example, you could think of a network protector, like the HP network protector one, that's strictly looking for malicious sites with a RepDB database. Maybe you put that in, in a guest network, right? That's kind of on the outside. And then you would have the DNS director, BlueCast DNS director on the inside to make sure people aren't hitting rogue sites or using rogue DNS servers within your own. Grail to be able to compile both together to be able to have a unified port, single port, be able to take advantage of the intelligence of both. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I see it as you know, I mean, there's some stuff you can do with with an open flow right uh, service chaining within the tables and things like that, but uh, but I think I think you're either going to have an app that controls both the other apps possibly, or you you have a, fu a unique functionality that requires both to happen, and so you write a specific app for that. Like we have, a, like I said, I'm consulting, right? So we actually have an app development service where we will work with. We have a set of app developers or the network consultants. We'll have to bridge that gap to those app developers and help you develop an application that would be a unique scenario like that where you want to hit that twice. So I think from an HP perspective, what we kind of wanted to do is, um, yeah, we have applications that we've developed, a couple just to kind of see the environment. Um, we also announced fully functional, the App Store is actually launched now, but we also wanted to allow other partners to get involved into the ecosystem and do other stuff, right? So we're going to allow a company like BlueCat, that that's what they do is, is DDI. They do DHCP, DNS, and IPAM. That's their core functionality. That's not our core functionality. So we're going to allow them to extend things, and, and maybe later on they will extend to start looking things <coughs> from, from the same kind of a network protector. But what they don't do is they don't do security research, right? And that's where HP, the tipping point guys, that's where their core functionality is. So it could be, you know, it could be kind of what, what we've done. You could split off into different DPIDs, so different logical um, OpenFlow enabled switches in your devices. That's one way to do it. You might be able to do it at layering the services at different points in your architectural blocks. So you could put it, you know, put your um, your blue cat right in front of your internet link. So as people try to go out and hit DNS out through that internet, that should normally never go there if that's hitting your corporate DNS. And then you just make them pin off and go go to the iPad, right? So it could be just a question of design. Eventually, yeah, I see these things starting to to kind of merge together. <coughs> get more as an industry more experience around how do these how do you take two flows that are, are trying to operate on the same traffic and how do we how do we resolve that, right? I don't know that we're there yet. Right now we have, you know, pick your poison and where do you want to put it? I think that's where we are today. You said something a second ago. When, uh, okay, so the packet gets forwarded into your controller. Yep. Not necessarily to the controller, to the security appliance. It's a big point I think. And if it decided that it was okay, it sent the DNS response back to the client as if it came from the external server. So, let, so two different scenarios. Two, two, yeah, so two, two different scenarios, right? One is one is the Blue Cat DNS director, which it's going to go up, it's going to get sent up to the controller. Controller is going to determine or is going to see that it's a malformed or a, um, a rogue attempt to hit a rogue DNS server. Hits the, hits the um, the blue cat Proteus, and then yeah, it's going to send it back down, uh, modifying the, the IP headers to get back down to the client with a full response, so that when it comes back down, it comes out at the end, it looks like it came from that same 8.8.8 .8 server. So they they feel that they got a legit response, but it was actually coming from the server. So the rest of the network needs to be set up to allow that. To allow to reverse path forwarding. Yeah, 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 we didn't have any issues with it in here, I guess, I, I yeah, um, yeah, it, it's not widely used, but right. it should be, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so go, check, go check out the internet journal, the, the um, most recent, September 2014 on DNS, interesting article, okay, so the, taking that example, DNS request gets made to 8.8.8.8, mm -hmm. right? 
and you say it goes up to the controller. Why is it going to the controller? So my, my mental expectation, and maybe this is a service chaining mindset, mm -hmm. is that you would presumably have programmed flows in advance that say, here are the legit DNS, anything else on UDP 53, mm -hmm. I'm redirecting to this destination, this Blue Cat device. For so, so yeah, and so it, the, something else going on so we're getting we're getting we're getting the tool a little bit. So let me. So, but yeah, so so in the in the in the blue cat scenario, it's going to look and see if it's destined for UDP port fifty three, and it's not destined towards the allowed list of DNS servers. Okay. Okay. Pick it off. Okay. In our in our network protector scenario, it says UDP four port fifty three. Send it up. So there's another one that we said, okay, if it's going to peel off every single DNS packet. At some point, this thing's got to choke. So we wrote a script. And when we were out here, we were able to get the script to do 40,000 DNS requests per second against our controller, doing the RepDV lookup, coming back, allowing it or not. And we had, I think, about half and half of, of legit versus not. But everyone going back up, and it was able to handle 40,000 per second. So but from what you're saying, the controller's in the traffic flow? In for, D, for DNS? For, for only, for, only for network protector. So for network protector, it is in the, so what happens is client sends it. So for our network protector, it comes up, hits the controller, controller does the lookup, says, yep, it's okay, it's good, sends that packet back down to the switch through a service tunnel, and then sends it on normal. So the client never sees it again. That wasn't maybe clear is open flows, reactive flows, proactive flows. Like these are proactive Correct. flows Fair enough. that are pre-configured on Thank switch. You. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I was trying to get to. But so what we just talked about there though is effectively you're sending it to the controller for a yes/no decision, mm -hmm. right? And then, you, from what I just understand from what you just said, it then tunnels the packet back to the switch and tells the switch it's okay, presumably yep. by programming OpenFlow, Correct. saying this is legit, pass yep. it on. Yep. And then the packet <clears throat> gets sent off. Follows its normal route. So, yeah, is there's... anyone else uncomfortable with the DNS packet going through the controller every time? This I thought we were separating yeah, control yeah. plane and data plane. This sounds awfully kind of so well, it's funny. You look at like yeah. firewall. <coughs> firewalls do the same exact thing. Why not? You know, so it's like check the packet, at the firewall, check the packet, at the access switch. So it's similar. Yeah, and you have to pick. You have to pick your poison, right? I mean, so like. Uh, I Ten seconds of latency. Well, so this, 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 this is well. That's just because they decided to put the controller in San Francisco yeah. because yeah. putting yeah. it in New York would be too easy. Right. So we put the controller. <laughs> we put the controller all the way out here, and it the, still the, worked. The design decision to put the controller in San Francisco yeah. was not a best practice. Specifically to add foolishness. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that was by design to, yeah, to, to see if we were talking about this and how many, especially on the Twitter community, blogging everything else going, this is not going to work, <laughs> right? How many times have we seen, theoretically, there is no, absolutely no way that you could put a controller somewhere else? Is this a smart thing to do? No. <laughs> Would you actually do this as a real design? Please, no. <laughs> <laughs> could you do it? Yes, but just because you can, doesn't mean Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. Right, it's like, yeah. yes, in this design, now we've added 100 milliseconds of latency to every DNS lookup, yeah. and that would be really stupid. And part of this, well, part of this <laughs> specifically <DNS>. was... <laughs> no, but, but DNS, is, yeah. DNS is not interactive. With this. If it's telnet session and you do that, you're going to go nuts. Right? Yes, yeah. right. With DNS, I get it. It's, it's, right. it's not such an overhead, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, in this situation, we're adding... 100 milliseconds of latency. And, and I think, you know, this is one thing that I understand may be unique right now to the HP boxes. I don't know. I'm not an expert on everybody else's boxes. But this is that we have the one open flow rule that does DNS, processes yeah. the rest of the rules, pipelines out to normal, and the network does what it does. So this is not, yeah. this is not getting into this any is only programming the exceptions here. Absolutely. It's a yeah. forward normal yeah. entry at the end that says. So button. with the other applications that you see coming and the yeah. stuff that's coming in the store, are these pretty much as the aim that they are hosted within the controller? So these are applications that are interacting real time with the flows, or doing, as you mentioned, proactive flows. So it's gonna like the like the the blue cat one, right? That that's a proactive flow. So yeah, it's gonna sit up there, but it's gonna do a proactive flow into the switch. But but yeah, other than that, I think the answer to your question is yeah, I see them residing on the controller or. But the, and the blue cat one sounds more like service training to me. That's just saying all DNS gets pushed that way instead mm -hmm. of where you ask for it to go. Uh, yeah, that's, that's just the protector protect one, but yes. Oh, yeah, sorry, sure. sorry, the protector one. I think, I think you okay. know, to kind of answer your question, I think it's, it's going to be, and it depends, right? Because there's a lot of monitoring applications that we don't have to do any reactive flows. We can kind of pull stuff from the controller as it's got all the flow knowledge, drop it into a database to RESTful APIs, and then mine the data for stuff 
later just to watch stuff. Think about in a, in a mirroring situation. How many times do you have the, the infamous network guy and app application guy battle that goes on and you got to turn on a port mirror somewhere and somebody screws it up and does the inbound port versus the outbound port, the mirror port versus the mirroring port. Right, and you, they goof something up and break things. So be able to go out there in this situation and just do replicate packet and send it in this direction, right? And I mean, that app doesn't exist today, but I think it'd be a pretty cool one to have out there, right? So there'll, there'll be apps like that that'll continue to come out. So, so what, what we have seen is like the Gardacore app, which is um, doing some really interesting things using the stereo extensions in OBS um, to look for multiple TCP transmits. And then it's basically, it takes, their app I think is called Active Honeypot. Is this yep. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it basically turns the edge of your data center virtual switch into a network sensor looking for uncompleted sessions um, with the idea that if you have somebody on the, the side of your network trying to scan and doing TCP uncompleted sessions, that possibly they're trying to do a scan or reconnaissance attack of some kind, and then they will take that, and instead of the honeypot waiting over in the corner and going, somebody find me, they actually grab the traffic and pull it to the honeypot. Right, so there's there's let's kind of see this, what yeah. Let's see now. Now that you've got a host that will dynamically react and tell you, I'm a Windows host, I'm a Linux host, I'm whatever, you know. So it, it kind of changes the paradigm of what we can do. And I don't think, as an industry, we understand what all those applications are. Some of them are going to be on the controller. And we're going to have to watch scale. We're going to have to watch processor. We're going to have to watch, you know, um, con different applications that that are trying to apply on the same traffic. All these conflicts. And there's going to be a whole suite of apps that are going to, have to start to come up that are going to be <coughs> off the controller, accessing through RESTful APIs, and doing things in non-real time. Like I said, just even if I've got all that flow knowledge sitting centralized in the controller, you know, pull the metering data out, I've now got network monitoring. Could I recreate NetFlow? Could I recreate, you know, all this other stuff? Potentially. Is that a possibility? Yeah, it is. Yeah, but th this in-controller or out-of-controller thing for the apps is kind of, yeah. that was kind of where I was going okay. before was... Yeah, that's, was there's nothing that says you can't have those apps sitting on a separate device. So okay. when they make the decision, simply make a request yeah. to the controller to please go program whatever yep. it is. Yep. We've got some trust issues to deal with, but, yeah. <laughs> sure. know, but beyond that. Yeah, I think that separation. Well, we all have trust issues. I'm just asking trust. I missed them. Sorry. Oh. The chip, these apps are all on the controller. Yeah, they actually they actually install on the controllers. So that's like our app store, right? That we've got. You can actually we've got this demo. You can go out there and on the app store, you can actually go launch app store, pick an app, download it, and it will install right on the controller. But yeah, that's what his question is, do you have to install on the controller? Why not have it external? It doesn't have to be on the controller. Yeah, I asked this actually a while back from a different controller, and I think it wasn't actually possible given the way it was architected with like Java or OS. Yeah, I, I think it's gonna be, it's not, uh, for us right now, it's not possible to yeah. de decouple. Could it be in the future? I, I don't know. I mean, we had, so uh, here we were testing, right? I said we were doing, we weren't able to do a full 40,000 when we moved out here, by the way, but that was just because our script wasn't, wasn't perfect, let's put it that way. So the latency actually kind of reduced our script capabilities. When we started hitting, hitting uh, DNS, uh, our, um, uh, yeah, DNS, no, sorry, <laughs> protector, thank you. When we started hitting protector, we started, uh, when we were out here doing the 40,000, we started watching CPU utilization, also we realized we're pegging out CPU. It was a virtualized, it's a virtual machine. More cores, we just added more, more CPUs to it, right? More cores, and uh, I think we put eight on there. So all of a sudden we saw that the, the single instance of Protector in that Java application, multi-thread, and it was doing 300% CPU utilization because clearly it was taking up three of, the, three of the CPUs that we had given it. So it was a nice one in that situation to have it just continue to add. So, yeah. so, so, so you don't expose everything via REST today? Is that why you can't decouple it? I, I, I don't know that I can answer the reason for de decoupling. I know in this environment for us, it was, we just spun up, we have, an, we have another controller up here that's doing the App Store demo and, and a couple other things. So it's like, it was, it was spin up another controller. That it just. In that environment, in like a multi-controller environment, you know, do you view that as two independent installs or is there a clustering mechanism behind, behind that? So if you have two, yeah, <laughs> so if you have, if you have two separate controllers, so we have an idea, uh, a concept of, of a domain, right? A controller domain. So you can absolutely start to group a number of network devices that they control within domains and have multiple controllers controlling those devices within domains. So that, that concept is there. As you start to have multiple apps, you still have to be, you know, that's why the consultants are going to still get, be getting paid, right? You're still going to have to, you're still going to have to have some intelligence behind are these apps going to interact with each other? Are these apps going to have problems, right? So, sorry, so the question is to rephrase it. Like in this design, two different apps, two controllers, 
Are they part of the same domain or a different domain? In, in this situation, we did not create them as part but of the domain. But possible to have that? Yes. Okay. Yes. You can have backup controllers per active controller? Correct. So where we are right now, you can do controller clustering, mm -hmm. but not controller federation between the same um, two band controllers from the HP standpoint. So we have done controller federation. So federation meaning two autonomous units, whereas clustering means they kind of operate as the same unit, right? Um, we have done controller federation with NSX, right? So we have been able to have NSX controller talking to us so we can do some of the VXLAN and VSDB kind of stuff on some of our top rack switches, right? So we have done controller federations. We're moving in that direction as well, but within our own self-contained ecosystem, you can have a cluster running one app, you could have another cluster running the other app, and they wouldn't necessarily share that information. Between. And if I understood correctly, on that bottom 3800, you basically said, if I understand correctly, that it is, it's effectively split, because you have one controller that's responsible so, for half of it, or some of the lens, mm -hmm. and the other controller manages the other bit. So they're not trying to both control the same ports, effectively, Correct. or at least the Correct. same VLANs. We have configured two different DPIDs on the switch, and we've taken, um, so the implementation is DPID equals a VLAN, and so I'm going to take VLAN 10, and I'm going to say VLAN 10 has an OF controller over there, of controller 1, VLAN 11 has OF controller number 2. So here you could have taken any any packet with port 53, duplicated it, send it to both controllers, and just say there's a conflict. There's a conflict, but in theory that could work in this design. No, we could if we if you wanted to send it to both. I mean, it comes down to who who ends up writing the flow into the table first. To be honest with you, right? So you would have to have that VLAN. That one VLAN would have to point at one controller, and that controller would have to have both apps on it. Right, and so it's going to send those up there, and well, it's going to the both apps are going to write their flows down in the switch. Whoever gets in there first is so that, as an action. So, as an action, you can't forward to two. So we could we could forward two destinations, or two destinations, but what happens on the reverse path when right, that decision right, right. made? Right, one of the one of the decisions is going to get thrown out because that's not my controller. Right, so I'm going to have a primary controller standpoint. So when it when it returns back, if I'm if I'm VLAN ten and going to controller ten and controller eleven returns, I'm going to go. I don't know. So we're going to throw that out. Have you done any work with uh, split brain analysis and what, what happens when you have two controllers? Set? Yeah, so that's some of the stuff that we want to do starting to go towards Las Vegas next year. For this year, we decided to just do more of the app interaction, distance, load. <laughs> You know how can we strategically place this throughout the network? So we just we didn't we decided to it was the one that we only had so much time and resources, right? So we, that was the one thing we decided to leave towards next year, and then start to do more of a redundant design and start breaking things and see what happens. Yeah, so I think that's important for production yeah. installs. Yeah, absolutely. A absolutely. So one of the approaches we've kind of taken that's a little bit different than the rest of the industry is we've we've taken from an SDN standpoint and looked at it from a campus edge, right? Everybody when you hear, when you say the words SDN, automatically your mind goes. Overlay, virtualization, data center, right? The risk factor of putting this stuff in and all these questions that are going to get asked are, and they're, they're great questions, but it's kind of like we have to do it to gain experience to learn what the mistakes were. I don't want to learn those things in my data center. I don't know about any of you guys, right? So what we've taken is a different approach and said, okay, look. Yeah, I'd much rather right. discover problems out in the college dorms where it's just <laughs> kids <laughs> downloading yeah. Torrent movies. That's why I think with Jennifer Expert from Princeton, I think she was working on things that compile different things up top to if you're gonna really see, you know, what the end result would be with multiple applications. I think yeah. it was her who was working on something like this. But um, some of that again yeah, at university it's like it makes sense to test it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> having <laughs> having run a university network, right. you know, the dorms are less trusted than the internet. <laughs> so so the nice thing down here is, is again from a campus edge, I apply my rule set, right? If it breaks, what do I do? I took out twenty four people. Worst case scenario, right? Maybe not even that. And if the rule really doesn't work and my controller goes down, there's a flow to normal pipeline that's the rules already instantiated in there, and it doesn't matter really because we're just going to revert back to normal network behavior, right? So we're trying to do this in a risk adverse way that will allow customers to start doing this and getting some operational experience and allow us as an industry and, and us as a vendor to start getting some more operational experience. So when it's time that we come and put this in your data center and say, trust me, as a sales guy, <laughs> right? Hopefully, we're going to be able to stand and go. We're not going to look at that till next year, right? That's not the answer you want from from your sales guy or your your technical sales guy. We want to be able to come with solid answers, right? And and do some of these crazy. It wouldn't be fun to do it local. Let's 
let's see what happens. Scenarios. Yeah. Think about the link optimizer that we've got, right? Uh, so our network optimizer, right? Application, right? So that all it is doing is at the, it's talking to the link server, as, as Chris was mentioned earlier, right? The the controller, the link server tells the controller that a call is about to be set up. So it tells, it says that Chris and I are going to make a call. Our IP addresses are this. And we're going to do voice on this port, video on that port, desktop sharing on that port. We can't do that today, right? If you're doing everything from a single IP and a single Mac, how do you prioritize that from a network administrator standpoint? You can't. Right? We're used to the hard phones, have a different Mac or put on a different VLAN, can't do it today. So this now will remark those packets. All it's doing is remarking the DSCP value. Other than that, the packet flows its normal route. So your worst case scenario in a controller down situation or lost communication or whatever it might be is, uh, is, that, is that that packet doesn't get remarked. So hopefully you're not on a regular basis utilizing the QoS in your network and using that prioritization and running your, your network to a point where it consistently needs QoS. So if it breaks and it's down for an hour or something, you know, at this point is at the end of the world that you don't have QoS in those packets or if you're not doing network protector for an hour or something. So you might have degraded service, but, but it's, it's but still they're still gonna work. Is that functionality from Link telling the controllers, is that built into Link as a standard thing or yes. something you worked with to get added well, yeah. So that's from an HP standpoint, R&D, I think it was like two years working with Microsoft to get that API okay. to a place where, where we could do what we kind of wanted to do with it, and it's Microsoft. So they just went, you know what, it's done, here it is, here's the spec. Yeah. So I know Aruba started to use it, Maru started to use it, right, so oh, other yeah. vendors. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting thing, because this is, this is a general thing with, you know, whether it's with VMware or, or any other virtualization solution we talk about, when you're trying to set this stuff up, We've got to have all these things talking to each other so that some system says, I'm building this, I need these things, so I'm going to have to go and tell these people. And there's got to be interfaces between all these components, or at least between some subset of them. And at the application layer, it's kind of even more so where it's dynamic. We, I'm just curious to see how many more of these we're going to end up seeing and get yeah, another stack of APIs. To <laughs> it's it's <laughs> to a really interesting, um, there was actually... Um, John Hudson, I don't know if he did it with, with you guys or somewhere else, but John Hudson from Brocade had a really, really clean definition for me. It was when an application can request service from the network and then the network can respond appropriately. That's SDN. Like that's, that's just a beautiful definition. And we're starting to see that. But you don't want that for all your applications. Wouldn't something like 802.1x fall into that definition? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so look at the really else. The F5 one, right? So the F5 one, if you guys are familiar with that, I mean, that was a, a fairly simple one, but can actually help out in an environment. So the F5 global traffic manager, right, sees a DDoS attack happening. All it does is tell the controller to tell the switch that's sitting on the outside, stop allowing that IP or those IPs and things like that, right? So now all of a sudden you reduce the load on your F5 application. So there's a number of different scenarios on both the edge and the access layer of the network that can start to be implemented you know, in short order, stop you from having to upgrade that firewall or upgrade that, that global traffic manager, whatever it might be from a hardware standpoint, right? So to mitigate some of that. Yeah, the, um, the link example you just gave, the marking is actually happening on the 3800. Is that right? Correct. Right. Okay, Correct. so it, it's looking at the 424. Port, yep. Port yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So right. Uh, so when, as soon as Link says, tells the controller versus Link telling the endpoint market there. Correct. Okay, that's, Correct. That's, 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 and that's the thing, right? So Link can't. Could Link tell the endpoint? Sure. What does that mean? <coughs> Means you need to trust right. QoS coming into your environment at all. Yeah. At all areas, which <laughs> obviously is not. If you want to do that, great. Because yeah, all the rest of it's still your normal QoS prioritization. You still need to configure everything else in your environment as you normally would. The idea is how can you get that at the edge, especially, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, I am set on Link. I mean, I don't use my phone anymore. I don't like dialing into conferences with numbers and things anymore. I love Link. So if a company goes out and spends all this money on Link and now they're having some quality of experience issues, how do they get around that, right? They spent a lot of money on that. It's a great application. I mean, Meg put out a thing telling us, Stop using our conference call numbers. Stop using that. We've saved, I don't know what the numbers are on how much we've saved on conference calling and just long distance and everything else, but it's been ridiculous. I mean, I have a worldwide role. I talk to people in EMEA and APJ all the time. Voice, video, desktop sharing, no problem. And that's all going over public out of my house. So it's even working in those environments. So. And the QoS configuration then between the endpoints that you're talking about, that is manually done? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. So today it is. Check and see if the controller yeah. was involved in that. Um, when we were originally developing, 
we wanted to do hop by hop QoS and just it wasn't fun. It was it was ambitious. We'll put it that way, right? Yeah. So the kind of the the what we're anticipating, what what our presumption is, is that you're going to have like an RFC twenty four seventy five diff sort of architecture all put out. Your QoS is going to be queuing mechanisms, all those things. You're going to be respecting the values. I know, I know, right? It's 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 good to it's, want things, right? It's right. indeed best of all possible worlds. <laughs> so um, you know, we're 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 making some assumptions for sure, right? Um, I guess from, from the other things to go back, what we're seeing a lot of is we're seeing a lot of these SDN apps that are starting to come up right now, working with partners, is extending what would have been a traditional monolithic device sitting in line as, you know, buy your 200 million billion dollar huge firewall to do all your throw, throughput and your F5 appliances and everything else, and starting to leverage SDN to push that out to the edge of the network to, to, to create your, your choke point on the edge of the network. And to ensure those those attacks that are happening at the edge of the network, right? So you're not spreading the infection or whatever it might be, all, all out. One other thing I want to mention from a, a distributed manner, which is more scalable. Yeah, exactly. Right. One other thing I want to just that popped in my head that we also ran into was what happens when <clears throat> this controller is controlling this DMZ switch and the controller is hanging off of there, and the controller is also controlling this 3800. And let's say it's in the, um, the network protector scenario, right, where all the packets, all the DNS packets are going to come in. So this client sends a DNS request, it's intercepted, and it's told to be sent back to the controller. Now, in our case, we service tunnels, so it's not going to be seen. But in other cases, if it's going to be sent here, what happens is that packet traverses if it's controlling all these other paths along the way. It's controlling these other switches, and the packet goes through. It's not going to double inspect because it knows about this entire chain. This is open flow. This is open flow. This is open flow. It knows about everything hanging off of all sides of that. But after it gets here, it's layer three routed. It's everything else. The controller has no idea what's this is. You will look at our controller. There's a whole bunch of these little switches just floating around, not connected to anything. So now when it comes in here, you have to be careful that you don't double inspect. So that was one of our things that we had to split off our controller onto a separate VLAN there so we didn't double inspect in that scenario. Otherwise, we would have gone from 40,000 to 80,000 packets per second, right? Things like that. So something else to think about as you start to think about designs in these environments, what do you do, right? So one of the other things, we actually did have one problem during the uh, upgrading. You want to tell me about the one problem we did have with that one switch? Oh, uh, which one? <laughs> the one that didn't upgrade because of the, because the space? Oh, yeah, yeah, all right, so really? <laughs> all right, <laughs> so so one of our guys, I won't say it was me, uh, went to upgrade one of our switches, right? And so we went through the whole thing, like make sure you do it right. So he gets out there and he upgrades it and, and he's, he calls him and was like, ah, Jeff, it's, um, it's not coming back. It's not coming back. It's like, upgrade it, put it on there, it's not coming back. Well, okay, you just put the code in. He's, yeah, I've done it in all the other colos, it's been fine. I'm like. Check space on that on that switch before you copy the code over and execute the upgrade. Like, I know I did it on the other ones. Maybe I didn't <laughs> quite do it on that. So sure enough, he had tanked the switch because copied the code out of there, and there was enough other code versions on there from the since 2009. That switch has been out there, right? And so he copied that code on there. But it was a great example too. If we got a switch that's been out there since 2009, we were able to upgrade it. And do open flow on it, but yeah, sure enough, we tank so, the switch. You know, I, I think that's a great, <laughs> a great place to kind of close this. Although we'll be around for questions, is you know, at the end of the day, the problems that we're going to have are the problems we've always had, right? It's it's people doing things without maybe paying attention, you know, not following the process, not following procedure, not executing operational discipline, right? So the nice thing is, is we're actually doing this live, and this is not, it's not on PowerPoint anymore. <laughs>